in this uh, what i have decided to do in this presentation is to talk about what is interdisciplinary research and uh, then also talk about how uh, you know what are the aspects that are required if you want to do translational research what are the uh, kind of setups that are required if you want to make uh, translational research successful and also why translation research is not something that is trivial it is a difficult thing to do and what are the issues that need to be addressed and if time permits i'll also touch upon a few examples from our own institute uh, where I used to work before, that is the National Inter Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, on the approach that we took in those days to bring about this kind of interdisciplinary interaction. So with that, let me start my presentation. As was mentioned, I am uh, currently an honorary professor at the, Interdisciplinary, at the Indian Institute for Science Education and Research. And, uh, I hope that uh, some of you will find the time to visit this institute. This is a newly uh, institute which has newly come up in Trivandrum. Uh, it is uh, on the process of being, uh, the infrastructure is now almost well developed and fully constructed. And uh, they would be very happy to receive visitors and to see the kind of uh, facilities and the research that is being considered, being uh, conducted in this, uh, in this institute. So let me start with this quotation from Karl Popper. Karl Popper was a philosopher of science uh, in the 20th century. And, uh, and he used to, and he's well known for, you know, uh, discussing many aspects of what, what is science, what is non-science. And in one of his books on the conjectures and refutations, the growth of scientific knowledge, he has made this quote that as scientists or researchers, we are not students of some subject matter, but students of problems. And problems may cut, a, cut right across the borders of any subject matter of discipline. So what he is trying to say is that, you know, we can't say that our subject is mechanical engineering or physics or biology. And therefore, uh, you know, if when we as researchers, our main job is not just to um, conduct research in our area of uh, domain uh, of expertise, but to solve problems. And problems will require that sometimes, even if you're a biologist, if you're really required to solve the problem, you might have to take the uh, help of a mathematician or a physicist or a chemist. And so what hinders us from taking that decision? Because many of us would rather remain in our own domain because that's where we feel confident. So I give this uh, uh, you know, uh, story. Uh, so basically what the question that we can ask is, does disciplinary practice limit the nature and scope of problems that we can address? Uh, supposing we remain within our own discipline, then what happens and how, how do we address problems? So I give you this example of this uh, cartoon. I think many of us would have grown up hearing the stories of Mullah Nasruddin. And this cartoon is showing, I mean, it, it may, you know, he's looking for a key uh, under the, the light of the lamp. And when somebody asks him, what is he doing? He says, he's looks, looking for the key. And he said, where did you lose it? He said, I lost it somewhere there, somewhere far away. Then why are you looking for it here? He says, that's where here we have more light. You know, I mean, this sounds of course like a ridiculous story, but this is what happens when many people stick to discipline. They know that the solutions to the problems may lie outside their disciplines, but because they feel comfortable being within their discipline, they keep searching for the solutions within that discipline. So this uh, requirement of going outside the discipline requires a certain amount of courage. And why that is, is that if you have, uh, if you consider these circles at different disciplines uh, and uh, they are not communicating, the problem, so the solution for the problem may lie in the interface of these uh, uh, disciplines. And uh, supposing uh, I say that this blue circle is chemistry, and I feel very confident because this is what I have studied throughout my life. Uh, I, uh, my area of sub specialization is photochemistry. I know the theory on photochemistry. I know the background research on photochemistry. So I feel very comfortable here. But supposing I have to stretch into photobiology, then I have to understand a little bit of biology. And when I go there into these areas, which uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, the blue and the orange circles overlap, you can see that there is a shade or, or a dark shade. And there I may not look that competent. 
I may not understand much of the language that is spoken there. Okay, so therefore, uh, th therefore, this makes many people hesitate into going into interdisciplinary interactions. The, the, the feeling that one may not sound like an expert when we discuss in topics which are not related to areas where we have, we feel comfortable in. But um, I once listened to a, a talk by a potential Nobel laureate who was saying that uh, looking for new results within your own discipline is like looking for gold in the city. Uh, you know the city very well, but uh, you know gold in the city, you will you very less chance of finding a gold in the city because most of it has been mined and taken away. Where you have chances of finding gold is between cities, that is in forests or places where people have not gone. And so that you can see that you can, if when you see the more and more interactions between different different disciplines that come in, the area gets darker and darker. And that is an area where not many people venture into, as I said, for several reasons. One of them that uh, you have the fear that you may not look like an expert when you are in a domain where you have not got the background training in. But as said by Karl Popper, if you want to solve problems, you have no choice Otherwise, you will be looking in an area where you have a lot of light, but very uh, unlikely to find solutions to the problems that we seek. So let me give a few examples of some of the early scientists. This uh, problem of interdisciplinary science didn't exist earlier. If you look at some of the early scientists like Newton or Robert Hooke, Edmund Halley or Robert Boyle, they never confined themselves to any particular dis, uh, scientist, uh, any particular discipline. And uh, a typical example I can give is that of Louis Pasteur. He was a model interdisciplinary scientist. And what he was looking at was problems, to real problems, like how the wine was getting spoiled uh, how, and, and asking questions about diseases. And this kind of uh, approach to science is what led to some very very surprising and interesting answers in microbiology and immunology. So, so basically these were early, early scientists were people with high level of curiosity and they were, like Karl Popper said, they were problem solvers. They didn't define themselves as physicists or chemists uh, as um, we tend to do in recent times. And this was true even in our country, you know, when you take C.V. Raman, he was uh, a physicist, and you can see that uh, he won is the, the, Raman, the Nobel Prize he won was for the Raman effect, which was in optics, uh, Raman scattering. Uh, and, but then you can see the kind of interest that he had uh, in his life. He was also interested in studying the harmonic nature of the Indian instruments, musical instruments, including the mridangam and the tabla. And uh, he was also interested on the optic basis of optical communications based on laser systems in his time. He was all you can see on the background, you can see that he is actually teaching uh, vision, how the eye responds to light. You know? And uh, the same is true of SN Bose. You can see uh, he, 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 people see him as a physicist, but you can see that he was a polyglot, he spoke many languages with a wide range of interests in physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, mineralogy, philosophy, arts, literature, and music. And uh, if you look at Sir J.C. Bose, he was also a polymath, physicist, biologist, biophysicist, botanist, archaeologist, and most interestingly, the writer of science fiction. And you can see the areas that he had pioneered, including uh, not just microwave optics, but also contributions to plant science. So you look at the range of problems that they were. So high, these were people with very high level of curiosity about life. And as I mentioned, the special aspect that he was actually a writer of science fiction. And today he is considered the father of uh, Bengali science fiction. Uh, and, uh, you know, so these were all uh, very renowned scientists. Uh, a crater in the moon has been named in his honor, of course, you know. So then if that is the, the case, and we say that uh, interdisciplinary science is so important, then why, uh, why did we have these kind of disciplines in the first place? Uh, so we, we will recognize that for that, you have to understand how science evolved. Uh, in order to be able to understand nature, it, is, it was very, very often, very often it was necessary to have reductionism. 
um, to understand, for example, the universe as such, you really have to go all the way down to the structure of the atom, uh, subatomic particles, uh, you know, and all those things, and, and the physics of subatomic particles are, are required if you really want to understand even the vast structure of the universe. So reductionism was that uh, since we had very little knowledge about how the universe is constructed, it was necessary to have these kind of specializations. Uh, to be able to understand uh, details regarding the universe. So I'll just give my own example. Uh, we all know about the cytochrome C oxidase, which is uh, in the electron chain mechanism, uh, reduction mechanism. And uh, when I had joined for my PhD in 1981 in Newcastle upon Tyne in UK, my professor was interested in studying the electron transfer reactions in cytochrome C oxidase. But very little was known about the protein in those days. And finally, if you look at the thesis that I worked on, was based on the simple electron transfer processes on copper amino acid uh, complexes. Uh, today, that would look like a very trivial system to look at, but that was the level of understanding that we had to go back. So instead of being able to study complex systems, you had to reduce it to its basic elements and look at electron transfer process. So, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the publication that we, um, uh, the, uh, the, the research that we published, even today, uh, some of the system, systems uh, are referring to that fundamental electron transfer processes that took place in those copper complexes. So it was a necessity to have that kind of reduction. So. Okay, so uh, why then do we need uh, interdisciplinary research? So, uh, and uh, so as I said, uh, one of them I mentioned earlier, if you want to solve problems, that is, uh, in, in if you want to real life problems in the world have to be sorted or uh, to be solved, then you cannot depend upon your discipline alone. The other is, of course, today, just like, like they gave the example of the cytochrome C oxidase, if you really want to understand these complex complexities, now, a chemist cannot understand cytochrome C oxidase reduction alone. The structure has to be recognized. You have to have physicists to recognize crystallography. Uh, you have to work with physicists. Biologists have to isolate the proteins. And all these uh, complex uh, groups uh, need to come together if you want to understand a, a system about how, how that works in nature. So understanding complexities basically requires this kind of interdisciplinary approach. Okay. And the other, as I mentioned, is the need for innovation. Okay, the other I mentioned is the need for innovation. And uh, which, uh, so I will try to talk, I, and as I said, in the first part, I will focus more on understanding complexities and then uh, building an interdisciplinary research team. And the second aspect about kind of how the, the kind of uh, steps that we need in order to develop and uh, to understand what is first of all innovation and how we have to establish systems that promote innovation. So, as I said, uh, you know, we can look at the reductionism. That is, if you want to understand the vastness of the universe, you have to go all the way to the subatomic particles that I said here. So, in between, you have all these other disciplines. And if you really uh, want to understand these systems based on the basic understanding now that we have about physics, chemistry, at the molecular. Is somebody higher education department in the FDP. I can see some other voice coming up. If there's somebody speaking, I would appreciate if they would mute their mics. Okay, so you can see that this uh, reductionism is what was required at that moment. But now if you want to understand many of these larger complexities, then you, have the, it, then you need to go back and you get, need to integrate these sciences together. And that integration is what we talk about as interdisciplinary research. So this will require conversations, connections, combinations of different fields, whether it is physics, chemistry, biology, whether it's engineering, whether it's computer science, all of these together today have to come together if we want to understand these complex systems. Uh, and let me give a, a typical example. Watson who was a biologist and Crick who was a physicist. And together with the X-ray crystallography, they, they could imagine the structure of a DNA, which is a basic life molecule for which they got the Nobel Prize. And of course, Venki Ramakrishnan, he was, uh, uh, he started his research, uh, he started his research as a physicist, went on to do research in biology, and then won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. 
So it's again a very clear example of a person who has worked in an in interdisciplinary area. So this is now becoming more and more important, as I said. So yeah, this is a quote from Jeffrey Wadsworth, who is a director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He says, one of the things that I have observed is how increasingly the fields of sociology, and it's not just sciences now, sociology, bioethics, economics, are necessary to execute our missions in the apparently harder science, whether it's physics, chemistry, or biology. Even in uh, these harder sciences, we need uh, uh, inter uh, contributions from the, uh, the softer uh, sciences or the humanities like sociology, bioethics, and economics to contribute that if you want to make a program successful. And a typical example is uh, climate change. And, you know, uh, the, the, uh, this is something that uh, because most scientists were focused on uh, uh, their disciplines, Arrhenius in 18, uh, you know, Arrhenius has, in 1896, he was trying to explain the ice ages. He had recognized that industrialization would lead to formation of carbon dioxide and that would lead to global warming. So in spite of the fact that this phenomenon was no, known for such a long time, you can see many scientists failed to address this. And that was because most of them were fo so focused on getting developments in their own specific domain areas that these larger issues like climate change and sustainable, uh, sustainable growth were left out of the system. So when we want to deal, about, deal with these kind of complex systems like climate change or uh, sustainable uh, development, you can see the, the words of Jeffrey Wadsworth become true because that here it is not just enough to focus on physics, chemistry, biology, and engineering. Uh, that will uh, solve your problems, but will that problem be solved in a sustainable manner? So that is where we need uh, sociology, uh, bioethics, and economics. That's a typical example. Uh, and it was uh, the reason that we, uh, that we neglected areas like sociology, bioethics, and economics that has led to this critical stage that we find whether our planet is, is, uh, will be uh, sustainable in the coming future. Uh, you know, a planet which is so many billions of years old, in about 200 to 300 years of development, we have brought it to a, a stage where the question of its very sustainability is in, uh, its very sustainability is in question. And uh, that is because we ignored to a large extent the interdisciplinary approach of taking for uh, 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 areas like sociology, bioethics, and economics into concentration. So the need to so, uh, so, uh, solve societal problems, as I said, requires an interdisciplinary approach. And um, but then there are, uh, as I said, if you are focusing purely on the engineering or the technological aspects, every technology in itself contributes to problems. Uh, I mentioned about greenhouse gases, global warming that comes up with the industrial development. Every time we use artificial fertilizers, this leads to <coughs> water purification, eutrophication, and nuclear power generation, again, very uh, good source of energy, but then what do you do with the radioactive waste? And automotive transportation, today we know um, that it has uh, so many advantages, but along with it, you have the disadvantages. And all, all of these, if we don't take the interdisciplinary approach or like the three topics you mentioned about sociology, economics, and uh, so then, then we tend to ignore the, uh, the negative aspects of this kind of technology development. So, uh, you know, other, it becomes a lopsided kind of development. So with that, so I think this gives you an idea about why interdisciplinary research is important. So let us now try to define what we mean by interdisciplinary research. So interdisciplinary research is a mode of research by teams or individuals that integrate information, data, techniques, tools, perspectives, and concepts, and theories from two or more disciplines. Uh, so, or bodies of specialized knowledge to advance fundamental understanding or, and to solve problems. Okay, that's a, a very clear and obvious de definition. So uh, here's a definition I have taken from Ruzena Batsky, who's the director of the Center for Information Technology. So interdisciplinary research by definition requires researchers to learn the other discipline. So I cannot as sit and say that now my area of this specialization is chemistry and uh, that is what I am an expert in. And if uh, you need a physicist, call him 
and use his expertise but i will not be interested in learning uh, uh, learning that aspect of it. this approach is not uh, going to help if you're going to do interdisciplinary research i'm i'm not saying that as a chemist you have to now become an expert in physics but you have to learn certain aspects of the language of physics particularly pertaining to the problem that the two of you are or two groups are trying to solve and that learning of that vocabulary and that interaction and the kind of methodology is what makes this a uh, this, um, what makes for what we call as interdisciplinary research. So uh, it is uh, rightly put uh, by Alice Gottlieb, who's a professor of medicine, says if you think of disciplines as organs, true interdisciplinary uh, this interdisciplinarity is something like blood. It flows. It flows. It is a liquid. It is not contained. There is no inside and outside. So, so interdisciplinary researcher will be able to comfortably move between these kinds of disciplines as and when required if he is to solve problems. Okay. So we often hear the word uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And what is the difference between what we call multidisciplinarity uh, or interdisciplinarity? Okay. So let's imagine that there is a problem that has to be solved and uh, two people uh, of, from dis different disciplines come and join together to solve the problem. And by the end of that problem solving, A, A contributes to that problem, B also contributes to the problem. But after the problem is solved, A goes his way, B goes his way. So this uh, problem solving has used the expertise of A and used the expertise of B and the problem has been solved. And this is what is called as a multidisciplinary approach. No transformation has happened to A, no transformation. He has remained a chemist or a, a, an engineer. And uh, B has remained as a biologist, and that's that. And the problem has been solved, and this uh, go their separate ways. Whereas in interdisciplinary science, when A and B come together, they learn the language that is required for solving that problem together. And that by doing that learning, there is actually a transformation that happens to both of them. A learns substantial portion of what uh, B knows regarding that problem. And, and vice versa. So then by the time this problem is solved, uh, they, and, and the problem also requires uh, this kind of uh, interaction, not the top kind of interaction. So this is what we call a true interdisciplinary research. Okay, there are many examples. Uh, in my own area, which is photochemistry of photonics, uh, when we talk about lasers, uh, and you, you can't talk about lasers just from a physics point of view. You need to synthesize dyes which have lasing properties. Uh, you need to understand the photochemistry of that. And you have to have engineering. You have to have, uh, and if you want to use those uh, uh, lasers in uh, for surgery or engineering applications, you can see that now this leads to a new field. Now, this is not physics. This is not chemistry. This is not photochemistry. It is not biology, it's not simply photobiology, although those are also interactions. So you can see an area like photonics is a highly interdisciplinary area. So it has led to a new subject in itself. And that is what we are talking. So A, uh, uh, for example, uh, a, a photochemist joins with B, who is a biologist, and you have photobiology as an example, which doesn't happen in the top case, which is what is called a multidisciplinary approach. So there are many examples, ecology and economics, you know, when understanding the economics between economists and ecologists and integration of their thinking with the goal of developing a sustainable world. So I have given a few examples of that before. Or biology, it is today without mathematics and understanding uh, DNA and the uh, DNA and the code and the genetics, it is impossible to do biology without mathematics and physical sciences. Uh, biology today, uh, if you give the example of Venki Ramakrishnan, without understanding molecular biology, you cannot do modern day biology. In those days where you could do biology without understanding chemistry are gone. Okay, so molecular biology is nothing but chemistry and understanding the structure of proteins and how they interact and what they do requires a very strong interaction between, and if you want to understand uh, the ecology, you can see that uh, ecology and economics, all these things. Uh, and one of the areas where, which is emerging area is cognitive science, trying to understand how the brain works. Uh, and these uh, cannot be answered uh, by a single discipline. You need anthropology to understand how the brain has developed. 
uh, and if you really want to make use of the uh, amazing ability of the train to build robotics, artificial intelligence, you have to understand neuroscience. Uh, it has implications in education, the, the cognitive science in linguistics and psychology and so on, and philosophy. So this is a, 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 a typical, you can see how many areas, the brain behavior, if we really want to understand that. Biocomputation, genomics and proteomics, biophysics, chemical biology, brain and behavior, regenerative medicine, imaging, biodesign, and so many disciplines can come together and make it a truly higher uh, uh, interdisciplinary area. So, so I think, uh, uh, so as I said, that I mean that kind of explains to you what we mean today by interdisciplinary. It's very different from what we mean by multidisciplinary research. Okay, so the so the then uh, of course uh, so therefore we understand then like what uh, Gabriel, who is a deputy associate director of White House, says, then that he says that there should be a sense of urgency. Why then do we def uh, have scientists who work within their own disciplines? Okay, so there is a there is a need for this, and that change should come rapidly. And uh, the entire idea of the chief minister and uh, the higher education council to start this kind of trans, uh, translational research center is with the with that idea in mind how do how can we speed up uh, interdisciplinarity in research uh, so i'll just give you this cartoon uh, otherwise we will remain like this chemist who says i am on the verge of a major breakthrough but also at the point where chemistry leaves and physics begins so i'll have to drop this whole thing so that was the approach till now and today we cannot take that approach uh, we have to, because, uh, you know, as I said, you stay in your domain, you look like a, an expert, you can be very confident, but you have to have the courage to move into areas where your uh, expertise levels may not be that high. Okay, so that with that, we have somehow understood why interdisciplinary research is important and what we mean by interdisciplinarity. So let's come to now what uh, we mean by, uh, so who's develop, by whose responsibility is it to develop interdisciplinary research concept? Is it the responsibility of the government? Is it the responsibility of the uh, institution or, or uh, organization or, or the university or the department? Or the scientists. At what level uh, do you decide that the research has to be interdisciplinary, and how do we promote that? Okay. So, of course, you, it is obvious that it is not the role of any uh, single organization or a single individual to develop that. Uh, it has. It is. It is something that can be done at every level. So, let me just give you a few examples. Many of you are teachers, so educators. So when you teach your subject today, it is not sufficient that you just teach your own domain knowledge. You have to see how your domain knowledge today fits into the rest of the world conceptually. How uh, 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 an area like mechanic, mechanical engineering can also fit into, say, for example, biomedicine or orthopedics. Uh, you know, I'm just uh, thinking off my head uh, here. That there, there could be many other examples. So every time we teach our students, uh, instead of just sticking to the domain knowledge, the, the v potential areas in which your that domain knowledge can apply and is of interest in, in, in systems, in larger systems. Uh, uh, so as an engineer, you, you talk, for example, uh, what is happening today in uh, Vikram Sarabhai space station. Uh, you, you, that's a place where many engineers work, but that's a kind of systems engineering because which requires people to understand chemistry, uh, work with chemists. If you're talking about uh, fuels that uh, that uh, fire the rockets, and how do you contain them? What kind of systems do you contain them in? So all this requires systems engineering requires this kind of complexity. Okay, so whenever you teach, whether you teach kinetics uh, as a chemist, we can teach, for example, kinetics. And you can see the implications that kinetics has in biology, the in, in, in implications that kinetics has in a chemical engineering plant. You know, so students should be aware how these kind of subjects that we have been teaching in these disciplines have interdisciplinar, uh, interdisciplinarity potential for interdisciplinarity, uh, interdisciplinary interactions. Okay, so that makes the role of educators very important. If you are to bring up a new 
a group of uh, new generation which appreciates the importance of interdisciplinarity not only does this help in, uh, in this helping the students to understand the importance of interdisciplinarity it also helps the students to uh, you know it makes them interested because they see the applications otherwise it is just a matter of learning a few equations or formulas and uh, passing few exams and that is why many students get put off and uh, uh, they don't attend the classes because most of that material is, will, will be available in any textbook or, or today it will be available on, 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 on in the computer or on the internet. So how does uh, an educator bring his subject alive into society and place it in the context of the problems that we currently face, whether it is sustainability, whether it is fuel shortage, whether it is uh, uh, non-conventional energy, so many issues that are uh, that need to be tackled in present society. How our subjects fit into that is something that educators can bring alive uh, for the students. Institutions, of course, they have a very strong role. They have to develop policies, um, uh, and that is what governments have to do, uh, and that is what the Higher Education Council is doing today to try and promote just this idea of having this kind of uh, uh, workshops and uh, uh, refresher courses for uh, faculty is is a way of um, is, is one way of uh, training researchers, students, and teachers, and also the idea of providing flexible funding. Uh, instead of just funding in the area of chemistry or biology or physics, how do we promote uh, funding? And then what we can talk about team leaders. Supposing you are a leader of a project team and that project requires a, an interaction with another group of scientists. So that the, the, the confidence to go and interact with them and uh, not say that this is my problem and I will do it. Uh, I will, uh, you know, the idea of uh, sharing that uh, the the, uh, the the honor of say let us say if it is a discovery uh, instead of trying to keep it to yourself trying to get somebody else come and join your team from another group they will also get the credit for it but in the process the problems you solve becomes much more relevant to society and much bigger otherwise as an individual the kind of problems you will tackle are much much smaller and trivial and if you want to meet, uh, tackle problems which are of, uh, uh, of relevance to society today, you have to be able to uh, have the courage to, uh, as a team leader, to incorporate other members uh, from other disciplines also. Funding agencies have a very important role because they design the, when you, uh, the, when you are making a call for a proposal, you can uh, uh, you know, encourage interdisciplinary research. Um, many of you must be member, maybe members of professional societies. So when you organize uh, discussions, the idea of how to what what is understanding what is interdisciplinary research, how to promote interdisciplinary research should be a matter of focus. And journal editors also, when you select editorial board members, when you bring out special issues uh, or reviews, uh, should focus on these kinds of things. And finally, the institutional structure. Uh, if you look at most, this is some place where many often uh, interdisciplinary research is um, discouraged because we have fixed departments, there's very little interaction between departments. So right from the top of the institution, the, the director has to promote this kind of interdisciplinary interaction. Uh, how to bring about uh, placing scientists or, or uh, uh, people with different skills in, in different departments and getting them to work together. What are the kind of uh, incentives that you give to bring about this kind of interdisciplinary interaction between your different disciplines that exist in your institution uh, and how do you bring in social sciences humanities and information science into research uh, you know uh, I, 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 and instead of just focusing on um, some very minute aspects as i said um, you know uh, this we are talking in this right now in the terms of interdisciplinary the reductionist science will continue because there is a need for that, but that will be done by a certain group. But along with that, the need for this interdisciplinary science for problem solving becomes very, very important. And therefore, that institutional structure should promote that. And you can see that is what has happened to a large extent in the West. You can see how universities have developed. Uh, you can see uh, these are some of the well-known universities abroad. And you can see that when they started off in the 1900s, how many 
where, you know, few disciplines that they have. And today they have uh, disciplines, some of them are virtual disciplinary uh, uh, disciplines, departments, virtual departments. But you can see that there are even 100, 120 even, uh, in some cases. Uh, and so they draw faculty from different departments and kind of form virtual departments where they teach subjects together. And so that has been a clear recognition of the growth and need for in, need for and growth of interdisciplinary science. Okay, so I think uh, with that, uh, uh, we have seen who, who, whose responsibility it is. Now let us look at the key conditions which are required for uh, interdisciplinary require, uh, stay, uh, research because it just doesn't happen automatically. And there are many stages. And the first and most important stage is bridging, uh, building bridges uh, 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 between people. So identifying common problems that can be solved. The leadership, that leadership has to have not just the technical skill, it has to have uh, other human skills like emotional uh, quotient, what they call leaderships, how to interact with different people of different, uh, with different personalities of different subjects and uh, conflict resolution becomes an issue. So leadership may, plays a very major role. An environment that encourages faculty and researchers to collaborate and establishing a team philosophy, okay? And then of course, the funding uh, that uh, initiates people to come together. Uh, so identifying a common problem and providing that money that attracts different groups to come together. And uh, seminars to foster workshops. This is of course, uh, I, you know, I, understandable and frequent meetings about the team members. So basically, it is important to think of the end right from the beginning. So when you are looking at an interdisciplinary problem, right from the beginning, you have to find out what are the kind of skills that would be required for solving that problem. And how do we inculcate that group, bring them together, make a larger team and work with these uh, and identify responsibilities uh, to and uh, harness the potential of the different team members. This next, of course, once you have that build, it is supporting the project. Science and engineering PhDs trained in research administration. Because it, if you, once you start doing interdisciplinary research, I said you need very high quality leadership. So it is uh, sufficient, it is very important to understand how fund transfer can take place, how fund allocation can take place. So this is not something that we can just leave to a trained administrator. The people who are running the project need to be uh, aware of how to manage the project, even in terms of financial and other administrative aspects. Uh, as I said, uh, so all these are will come under what we call as leadership skills and last uh, willingness to take risks and recognize the potential for high impact and uh, involvement of funding agencies. Okay. And the other uh, thing that is the next thing uh, is requiring uh, facilities. Today also we have monopolization of facilities. You have facilities within a department, sometimes within the expertise, is the, an expert instrument, expert scientist holds the instrument all to himself. So shared instrumentation becomes very, very important. Enhance uh, chance meetings, so for example, have places where scientists of different disciplines casually talk together, like a cafeteria where uh, the role is not to, uh, it's just to get people to talk about their own research uh, or informal seminars, uh, all these things become very, very important. Okay. And then uh, the organization administration becomes very important. What is the structure of your organization? Uh, does the leadership uh, uh, reward uh, academic leaders who foster interdisciplinary research? How do you work on the tenure or promotion policies? Uh, will uh, somebody who uh, I remember when I started my research career uh, and I was working on photochemistry of liquid crystals uh, and uh, very often some of the senior scientists used to discourage me. They said that you will not be recognized for many uh, awards or recognitions because they will ask you what are you, whether you are a physical chemist or an organic chemist or an inorganic chemist. Fortunately, I, I was not interested in that uh, approach. And this, this, uh, the idea that a system encourages, uh, looks at you as either a physical chemist or whatever you contributed to physical chemistry or organic chemistry or by, tends to drive many people to re remain restricted, do their own research, uh, hoping that they get recognition in that area. 
but this, so that means you are really working for recognition. Whereas in the other case, like Karl Popper said, if you're interested in problem solving, then uh, uh, you will um, range out into different ventures. You will not be defined by the, the seniors into different domains. And this becomes very important. And uh, honors may come, may not come, but the satisfaction of doing good quality research of relevance becomes very high in your profession. And uh, I think uh, we are nearly coming up to an hour now. So maybe I'll just quickly go through some of the uh, kind of interdisciplinary groups. You can have small groups with 10 or so, which is very easy uh, to work with. But when you have larger groups, then uh, the administration, of course, becomes very important. And uh, like now, for example, the Higher Education Council is planning to set up uh, translational uh, research centers in different universities. How a lot of planning needs to go into that. Now, how do we select faculty? How do we uh, bring in uh, the, the the facilities for that? Who is going to manage that? You know, and uh, well, one of the things that you can have in such places is what they call hotel facilities, where different industries can come and uh, temporarily set up facilities or offices to work there. Uh, and uh, when the problem is solved, they can go away. So these kind of uh, things uh, need to be looked at uh, in uh, industry by nature is interdisciplinary because uh, they have a top down approach. They want to have their product. So they will look for uh, the solution and they don't restrict themselves. And so how do we get these kind of groups, small groups, large groups to interact with the industry? That is, again, one of the roles that a translational research center would have to do. And many national research laboratories have recognized that the need for interdisciplinary research. As I said, our own institute used to be known as Regional Research Laboratory. And we changed our name sometime in the 200, uh, 2003 or so. And we made some, took some very active steps to cut down the old culture, remove the old culture, close off many disciplines, integrate many disciplines, and bring together uh, a kind of interdisciplinary research. Uh, Inter-industry, inter-university, university industry, interested in industry. This is what would really, if we are setting up these translational research centers, this is what a center should more or less look like. And uh, how, uh, so, so very vibrant interaction between available industries who are interested in solving problems, uh, the different major institutes which are uh, uh, in, present in your, in, in your area or in the state, how they can come together. And uh, as I said, the uh, Higher Education Council or the government can work on how to provide seed grants, which is what they are in the process of doing, and also training. Uh, many of the faculty today don't have training in interdisciplinary research. And so that is also something that is... Uh... So let's look at some of the, the challenges. Um, okay. So as I said, uh, I gave my own example. The, uh, the system of academic advancement favors independent researchers. So this is something that needs to change. Uh, and uh, as individuals, we can uh, overcome that because if you are not overly dependent on that and you're interested in solving problems, you can do that. But as an institution also, we need uh, to understand how you know scientists need to be recognized for the effort that they make in interdisciplinary science. Uh, most institutions have scientists in, di in discrete departments. That is how it is in most of our institutions. How can we get them to work together, sit together? Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, then also uh, how, who appreciates interdisciplinary research? If you are doing interdisciplinary research today and your papers are being reviewed by somebody who's a specialist, he will see this as rubbish. He says that's not uh, focusing on some. So understanding, we will need uh, the trained interdisciplinary researchers who are able to understand uh, uh, the, the difficulties of doing interdisciplinary research and also the advantages and also the quality of that. How do you judge it if you really have not done inter interdisciplinary research yourself? And it is tough for students uh, sometimes to get jobs. And that is something that needs to change. Uh, and people need to understand that these are the real problem solvers. In fact, I would say that this is not a problem. In fact, many of our students who are PhDs or specialized in different disciplines, they are the ones who don't find uh, jobs when they go to the industry. Uh, on many occasions, I have seen that many PhDs saying that they, they find it difficult to get jobs. And if you talk to industrialists, they find it, say they say, we are, fi we are finding it difficult to recruit scientists with the appropriate skills. 
and that is because many of the scientists who have taken PhD have taken it in very intensely depth uh, in solving an in-depth problem within a certain discipline, which makes them useless for solving larger problems in society. Yeah. And the most important challenge is that it takes time. You can't uh, develop interdisciplinary culture overnight. It takes some time, get people together, uh, understand uh, problems, understand the language and communication, all that takes time. Uh, the one important thing is that if you really want to do good interdisciplinary research, you have to be an expert in your own area. So if I want to do uh, interdisciplinary research as a chemist uh, and uh, as a photochemist, I want to do in, uh, interact with the biologist, I have to be an expert in photochemistry. And uh, without that, uh, if, uh, uh, if I go in, then I don't add value to that group. And the person who is, say, for example, if it is photodynamic therapy of cancer, the biologist who comes to in, into this team has to be an expert on cancer. So your domain expertise has to be very, very strong. This may look counterintuitive because uh, you say that you want to do interdisciplinary, but then why do you? So you don't start off as an interdisciplinary science. In the early stages, you have to build a core strength and that core strength is what helps you and makes you a valuable member of an interdisciplinary team. If you don't know your, if you're not a real expert in your own domain, then you are not adding value to that. But once you become a member of the team, then you have to start learning the required amount of language from the other sciences. That is what is meant. So right from the beginning, if you say that I'm doing interdisciplinary research, sometimes the value you bring to the team will not be that great. Okay, so once you have that, then you can build uh, and develop interpersonal skills. All these are required. Okay. So, yeah, just to identify yourself so I know if, uh, what your subject is. I have a computer at Government Women's College to Andrew. Yeah. Your, what is uh, your subject? My, I teach English. English, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. So, I've been talking science most of the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, like for instance, um, yeah. if an English teacher were to dabble in the laboratory work of, say, a zoology teacher, it would often be considered a nuisance. Yeah. So, how can uh, we as uh, teachers and colleagues collaborate in a post facto fashion without some kind of a previous blueprint that would enable us to collaborate together on some project? If the work is post facto and afterwards, is it possible uh, for us to come together and sit around a table and to chart out a plan in order to progress? Uh, because it is very easy to form a blueprint beforehand and work accordingly. Uh, but once someone's project has been finished, like for instance, I work on uh, medieval Bhakti poetry of Kerala. And if one of my colleagues uh, in the botany department is working on the fauna and flora of uh, early modern Kerala, uh, how can we come together and work after our projects, respective projects have been finished? That's my question. Yeah, I mean, it's a answer, uh, right? And uh, so, and that has uh, addressed a very specific detailed uh, aspect of your uh, subject, like you described. And the other person has done something, say, flora and fauna, right? But let us say that the other way around, when you are thinking about uh, the flora and fauna of, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, say, a place like Kerala, it had had its historical importance at some stage. And you are you are talking. You said about the history of of Malayalam. What you said, your, your own area. You mentioned. I think you are muted. I can't hear you. Interesting. Hello, uh, sir. You are not audible here. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Yes, now I can. Yeah, no, I so so what is your area that or you say? What is your research topic? It's a mystical poetry of Kerala. That was my topic. Mystical poetry of Kerala. 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I find, I mean, that's an answer question that I, I find uh, difficult to answer because you have been, so it's, you know, you're very highly focused uh, aspect of your research, which is within your own disciplinarity. And, uh, you know, so there is very little overlap, let us say, with flora and fauna of, uh, of, of the state. So the, the, the post factor to bring that kind of interaction, to me, at least it seems uh, difficult. But on the other hand, if you were to look at what the flora and fauna of uh, uh, earlier uh, Kerala was, and for example, I'm just out of my sticking off the off the top of my head, and that uh, people would have uh, written about the mystical aspects of some fragrance or something or of that time, and uh, you know how whether that plant is now there or extinct or what is the value of that and how people of that society of that time respected those kind of flora and fauna and if that finds its way into poetry, mystical poetry. That would be a fascinating area for interdisciplinary research. So it has to be the interdisciplinary aspect has to be built in right from the beginning, you know. So otherwise you're forcing the system to come together and you're forcing to find a, a, a kind of a, a, a overlap, which may be difficult. Okay, so you have there, there, are, there will be areas of overlap that occur naturally. So and for some reason, if you decide that you want to work with somebody who is doing biology, who has some interest in, for example, when the Dutch actually came here, or is uh, Malabaricus, and they were trying to understand the flora and fauna of, uh, of, of Kerala at that time and its implications in medicine, and whether that has found its way in some kind of literature in Malayalam, if there is an overlap into that, then that would become an interdisciplinary topic of research. That has to be built in right from the beginning. That's my opinion. You know? Thank you. Sir. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, I welcome all of you back to the second session uh, on the second topic, which I said where interdisciplinary research becomes important. It is in the area of innovation. Um, the last question that was asked to me was asked by somebody from the language fac uh, faculty, la language department. But I was, you know, I have been talking mostly about science because that's my area of expertise. Uh, and uh, I was told that the large number of uh, people attending these are uh, from the engineering sciences and uh, computer sciences. So I, I am sure that uh, interdisciplinary actions regarding, regarding uh, with respect to humanities will be covered by other resource persons. So <coughs> here, I am actually going to be focusing on, in this session, I will be focusing on uh, what we call bridging the innovation gap, um, you know, uh, and uh, and also towards the end, I will give a few examples of how we manage this in our National Institute for Interdisciplinary Research and Technology. So when it comes to research, scientific research, uh, we have what we call creation of a novel idea or creation of a novel product. And this is actually called as invention. Now, it is not necessary that this invention actually finds its way into society. It is, uh, it can remain as a curiosity. It can remain as a, a something that is a, exciting to report, but it may not actually have any value in society. The, out of all these uh, inventions, a few of them actually cross over into society and become useful. And that, when that happens, that is when we call innovation happens, okay? So whenever we have a novel idea or a product and that novel idea gets implemented uh, and uh, it produces either improved products, processes or technologies, which leads to either some kind of economic value or societal value. And that means society accepts it. This uh, and it, 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 then you start seeing it in various uh, arena other than the laboratory. That is when you say innovation. So there is a distinction. But what we mean by invention, novel idea or product, and innovation. Innovation is crossover happens into society in terms of application. Okay. So and uh, this is not something that can happen automatically. There have to be certain steps that need to be taken if you want to emerge, improve the commercialization or the societal value of you want to take your product into society. There are some steps that need to be taken. Okay, so very often uh, this innovation is called as applied research, and the other one is called as uh, scientific research. 
but I will go, you know, give you this quote by uh, Louis Pasteur, who said that there does not exist a category of science to which we can give the name applied science. There is science and the applications of science bound together as the fruit of the tree which bears it. So basically what uh, Louis Pasteur is saying is you nurture the tree of science, nurture the tree of knowledge, then automatically the fruits will come and the fruits are the what we call innovations or products that get into society. So let's see how that uh, how true this statement is. Okay. So I will give examples of two successful innovations which we take, uh, which we see in society. One is liquid crystals. Now, all of you know what is a liquid crystal display. Yeah, and you have it on your cell phones. You have my computer displays, a liquid crystal display. So liquid crystals in today's society is, is ubiquitous. Yet when you look at how it was discovered, it was discovered by a plant physiologist as early as 1888. And what was he doing? He was just separating products from a plant and he was looking for the, the different chemical chemicals he could identify uh, like a natural products chemist. He could identify certain chemical molecules and he used to study their properties, physical properties. And one of the properties, of course, as a chemist, when you identify a new product is you may study its melting point. And most compounds melt very sharply. What he found with one of the compounds that uh, Reinitzer um, discovered was it didn't undergo a very sharp melting. It formed something like a viscous liquid, which then melted into a clear liquid again. So it had something like two melting points, which confused him. He thought the product was not pure. He purified it, but he still saw the same effect. And so he, once he was sure that there is, is not a matter of purity, he felt that, there, that he had a new kind of material. And you can see the interdisciplinary interaction here. He sends this material to a physical chemist in Aachen, in Germany, who is, uh, looks at it in a microscope and finds that what it is, is it was a liquid. It flows like a liquid, but it had the properties of a crystals. Crystals have properties which like, you know, they refract light. You get more beautiful colors from crystals, which you normally don't get from liquids. So in this case, this liquid was also giving that kind of uh, um, reflections and refractions leading to very bright colors. And uh, that is when uh, Otto Lehmann and uh, uh, Reinitzer actually discovered what is they then called, and in German they call it Flutziger crystalline or flowing crystals. And that was a discovery of liquid crystals. But you can see that that happened in 1989. And uh, in 1962, they can see that large gap, nearly, um, you know, 70 years or, or more, uh, you know, where they actually used it for a device uh, to show that you can actually, if you apply electric field, then you can switch these liquid crystals between two electrodes. So then they had a material which reflects light, which will also be controlled by, uh, by an electric field, and it was a major breakthrough, but still nothing much happened. And it is only in around 1970s that they first developed those Casio watches, the black and white watches uh, that we, um, if you remember, some of you remember uh, old watches. And then today, of course, you have uh, the display systems that you have on your cell phone. So you look at the discovery, 1888, and the technology is developed only in 1980 or 1990. So almost 100 years before the, between the discovery and the actual application uh, happened. So this, when you follow Louis Pasteur's idea that you nurture the tree of science, that you find all the, make these discoveries and these discoveries will actually lead to technologies. If you lead it to its own, you can see that it takes a long time. And let me give you another example. Okay, in 1927, Pauli and Darwin, they understood that uh, subatomic particles like electrons and pro protons had spin. And they introduced the idea of spin in quantum mechanics. And their idea was not to develop any product that was purely to understand properties of subatomic particles. And uh, then it was in 1937, where if in order to understand what the spin was, he observed it under the magnetic resonance for which he was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1944, that is in 1937. Then this led to uh, a solid state uh, nuclear magnetic resonance technique 
for develop, the study spin in bulk material. And today, all of us have heard of MRI. Okay, so we take it for granted. You go to the in Trivandrum, you go to the med, uh, medical college, that street, those um, many of the diagnostic centers have uh, an MRI, and we take this for granted. Without having this natural fundamental breakthrough in uh, subatomic particle structures, we would not be able to develop this. So Pasteur is right when he says that you nurture the tree of science and you will get fabulous products out of this. But the question is, look at the time, when you look at the time frame, you see that it also takes a long process. Okay, so today people are not that patient. So when they invest in science, they would like to see the benefits of science reaching society much faster. So that, so this earlier approach is, uh, you know, uh, tends to um, uh, take too much of time, and therefore, is people are trying to find are there ways of increasing the rate of that innovation. So uh, in order to understand that, let me describe to you to this quadrant, which is known as the pastures quadrant. Okay, what we have here on this axis is as you go up the relevant for advancement of knowledge, like understanding the spin of an, uh, subatomic particles or understanding a new structure of a chemistry, chemical molecule like a liquid crystal. So that has no application. But that is advancement of knowledge. So as the relevance for advancement of knowledge goes up in this axis, and here it is the relevance for immediate application. How do you, how applicable it is? The science may not be that very high, but it is applicable to society. Okay. So obviously in this quadrant where the relevance for advancement of knowledge is less and the relevance for immediate application is less, nobody wants to be there. Okay, so we, we ignore that. But on the other hand, if you're talking about something like uh, uh, spin of uh, subatomic particles or discovering new materials like liquid crystals or nanomaterials, so that is the relevance of advancement of science. So that is called pure basic research. And Pasteur calls it, sometimes he called this the Einstein quadrant. Okay, some Einstein uh, theory of relativity so there is no immediate application, but you can see that there is a relevant a relevance for advancement of science. So Pasteur called this the um, Einstein squadron. Then you have what we call as pure and applied research. Here, the science may not be that important. Uh, it is application which is important. And uh, one of the examples, Pasteur calls this the Edison quadrant. Edison found out about the tungsten bulb, the use of tungsten for the tungsten lamp. And what he did was he was not studying the science. He was just using different different metals. And he went through, as he said, many failures. Finally, he found out that tungsten works. Okay. So uh, here, they, so he didn't try to understand some fundamental properties of these metals or others. He just kept on changing the metal till he found the metal that was useful because he was looking for an application. He was not interested in advancing knowledge of uh, a structure of metals or something like that. So this is called, this pasture calls the quadrant as the uh, applied, uh, the Edison quadrant, so pure applied research. Here we have the other quadrant where the relevance for advancement of knowledge is high. At the same time, the relevance for immediate application is also high. This pasture called the pasture quadrant. So, and he also calls it the use inspired basic research. So just like some, the, the question that was asked to me about post facto, when you want to do interdisciplinary science, then you are driven by the fact that you want to solve an interdisciplinary problem. That here, you first look at the problem that needs to be solved and then try to do the basic research that is required to solve that problem. So that's what is called use-inspired basic research, as uh, 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 opposed to pure basic research, which is blue sky research, which is something that I do just because it excites me and it advances knowledge. Whether it applies for uh, uh, put, uh, has a potential application or not, I am not worried about it. But sometime in the future, this knowledge will be useful, like the two examples that I gave in the previous slide. Okay. So what is important here is that this can be done within a group. Uh, some simple person like some one individual like Einstein or a scientist working with a few students can do this kind of research. This also can be done by individuals, somebody like Edison or somebody who is interested in making a device which has certain limited applications. 
uh, without understanding the science of it. That also can be done by a group. But if you want to do this use-inspired basic research, you cannot do it on your own. You need this kind of expertise, you need this kind of expertise, and you need a pull from society, you need industry to be involved, you need the governments to be involved. Okay. Uh, so, so that is where this becomes highly interdisciplinary in nature. So to build, a, so if you want to come into this quadrant, you cannot do this as an individual. You have to become an interdisciplinary, you have to build an interdisciplinary team. It has to have interdisciplinary support and only then you can come into this quadrant. And in this way, you can promote innovation much faster. Okay, so how do we build this kind of team? And I will give two examples in different sectors of how they have done this. And uh, okay, so uh, let me introduce you to another term which is known as valley of death. What do we mean by the valley of death? As I said, that inventions are coming in the products of basic research a new idea, a new product, whether it has come to use into society or not is, is not relevant here. So, that is basic research. On the other hand, you have something that has to be useful in society that has to be innovation. Now, for this basic research to cross over, there is something called the value of death. Because if you look at the 90% of the products, uh, ideas that are developed in the laboratory, only very 100%, uh, I mean, if you have developed 100 products, only one at most, 1% to 2% actually cross over. Most of them actually die here. They remain as good ideas. Uh, novelty is very high, but they don't become products. So that is why this is called as value of death. 99 0.9% sometimes die in this value of death. Only 1% crosses over or at best 1 to 0.1%, 0.1 to 1% will cross over. So that is why this uh, uh, valley is termed as the value of death. And that has a negative connotation because obviously these are not crossing. Okay. So how does this uh, uh, valley arise? Because there is a peak on this side. Okay. So governments for normally they fund basic research and they try to build up the infrastructure of an university or an institution and the capacity to do basic research in the hope that some of these things will cross. Industry, on the other hand, they want to look for products which are guaranteed successes and they don't want to take any risk. So they will not support any of this basic research. They will take in anything out of this that has a very strong chance of succeeding and then support that. Okay. So basically, what we are seeing is you have a value of death, as I said initially, that has a negative connotation. But you must also remember that a valley can exist only when you have peaks. So you have a peak here, which, should, you should, which we should be happy about. You have another peak here. There you have a, a in institutions which are working well, producing new products. You have industry which is using products uh, and bringing it out into society. So you have two peaks. So instead of focusing on the valley, we should be focusing on these two peaks. And then what we need to do is to see uh, that, uh, you know, that there are these institutions there which are creating potential products which are of value to society. So instead of focusing on the valley uh, as a negative connotation, what we should do is that we should look at these ideas as seeds and uh, to try and bring these seeds to the other end, we have to look at ways of uh, bridging that. So that means how do we fund this intermediate stage? And uh, as I mentioned, the Higher Education Council is thinking of starting translational research centers. Uh, and that is like trying to build a bridge that can take these ideas from the laboratory into society. Okay? And uh, so basically, uh, we have to find out who will fund this stage because uh, governments generally don't fund this. Uh, the uh, industry will not fund this. Uh, there are some exemptions. Uh, you will see how different countries like UK and US and Germany have tried to tackle this problem of what we call bridging the valley. Okay. So why do these valleys exist? Uh, you can see that if you look at a researcher in an, in an academic institution, he is interested only in uh, his uh, recognition, which means he is interested in finding something very novel, something very uh, something that has not been reported, whether it is actually potentially useful or not, is not something that immediately excites him. 
So that gives him recognition, some new discovery like the liquid crystal or new nanomaterial or something that gives him a recognition. So he he's therefore he's not concerned about the cost. And he also doesn't, he's not very aware of the problems that uh, face the industry. And if you look at the kind of journals he reads, mostly he reads journals in his own area of expertise, whether it is uh, American Chemical Society or uh, uh, you know, uh, some or it is a journal of physics. He refers to those journals. He will not refer to industrial magazines. On the other hand, if you look at the industrial mindset, they are interested in profit. They are interested in minimum risk. Many of them have established infrastructure which they are not going to change unless they are guaranteed that that change is going to bring them a lot of money. So what we try to do is, therefore, we try to change the researcher and try to make him think like an industrialist or we ask the industrialist to think like a researcher. And that is the mistake sometimes that happens. Instead, uh, we should value this mindset because it is the, this mindset that creates all these new ideas and products. And it is this idea mindset that makes products actually successful. So what we should, as I said, look at these two as peaks and instead of uh, uh, complaining about their lack of interaction, we have to find ways of bridging that value. Okay. So I will give few examples of how that bridging of the valley can be done. So normally, uh, when we talk about uh, innovation, we talk about somebody who does a research in the laboratory, he has a proof of concept, which is a new idea or a new product, and then he wants to show that it's acceptable to the society, he builds up a pilot project, pilot plant, and then he scales it up, and then finally the industry is ready to take it out and market it out. So usually this is the uh, scheme that has been followed for a long time and you can see <clears throat> this that is the reason many of them die and because it's practically impossible for a researcher to follow this through so most of them when they have reached a new idea a new product and once they're asked to prove for, for the proof of concept in terms of larger uh, applications in society the researcher loses interest and he moves on to another problem okay? and that is the reason many of them don't cross Instead, on the other hand, what we need is a structure which is something like this. So you have the uh, laboratories where they create knowledge and you have the industry which is using uh, this knowledge. But you can see that at every stage, right from the defining the market need to proving the concept, detail, all of these areas, there are there is scope for innovation. So basically, there has to be a very strong interaction between the institutions that create knowledge, the institutions that use knowledge, and there has to be a strong interface that at every stage, there are minor problems that need innovative solutions to, and that can be promoted by this interface. Something like, for example, the translational research centers that the, the state government is planning to set up. Okay, so what can form that translation uh, transfer interface? And as I said, different countries have tried to make different uh, uh, solutions to that. Uh, and uh, one of the countries that had taken a lot of effort in understanding what is innovation was the UK. Uh, their House of Commons had discussed these things, these things in detail, and they came up with this idea, uh, understanding that innovation is not a simple task. It is very complicated. And unless there is a lot of support from the government, from the industry, from the society, from the academicians, uh, from uh, small scale, and unless this whole network is built up and strengthened, uh, you will not get uh, this flow. So in India, for example, we see the government funding the finance uh, up to for research, uh, if, uh, research funding agencies will be uh, given the money and they will fund universities and public sector to some extent. On the other hand, you will have some interaction with medium scale, large scale industries, very minimal inter interaction between these two groups. But if you want the innovation scheme to be successful, then it has to become an entire cycle. You have to see that this uh, has to, you have to have venture capital, you have to have medium, small scale interaction. And then what that happens is that this forms a closed loop in the sense that you build up research, gets used to pay the industry, the industry makes profit, the money flows back into the system, uh, and you can support more and more universities. And so unless you close that loop, so otherwise what we are doing is we are converting all this money into publications and patents. 
Now, those publications and patents, if you have to create wealth, which can then be pumped back into uh, universities to create more publications and patents, and then that can be used. This kind of ecosystem is, is, is a necessity. Okay. And uh, so, uh, and depending upon different sectors, the time span for this innovation can vary. Uh, for example, if you take the um, pharmaceutical sector, the software sector, and the energy sector, you can see that in the software sector, innovation is relatively takes less time. And the amount of money required is also not very high. Risks may be high. Uh, innovation uh, intensity may be high. Uh, and But you can see that uh, the, the risk, uh, the capital required is also low. So that is why you can see that in India, we have had re reasonably good success. These small teams have joined together to come up with some many interesting, innovative ideas which have gone into the market. Whereas if you are looking at the pharmaceutical sector, you can see that any new drug, for example, has to go through so many stages of testing and that risk is very high, you know, and, uh, but the, the, uh, the, the dividends can also be very high. And so therefore you can see that in India, this, uh, there are only very few companies that uh, venture into this area. And the last is, you can see energy, uh, for example, non-conventional energy resources. You can see that the, here, for example, the costs are much, much higher, the timescales are much higher, that even in advanced countries, you can see that there is, uh, they have difficulties in uh, developing non-conventional energy sources. So uh, depending upon the area, the, the extent of difficulty in translation can be very different, okay? So uh, let me give you a few examples. Because of this difficulty, uh, this, now the industry takes care of in developed countries. This in whether developed and less developed countries are also able to do. But he, as I said, even in developed countries like US, they find this difficult. So let's see how the United States government, for example, tried to address this bridging of this gap. Okay? Because they know that there is a potential, uh, the clean energy. You know that the sustainable uh, uh, growth of the planet requires that we have... Uh, uh, so the, nobody is denying the importance of uh, clean energy, alternative energy sources. But you can see that most countries have vested so much of infrastructure in coal, infrastructure in uh, other uh, forms, thermal nuclear energy and other forms of energy, that if you want to change it, it will require a huge investment in terms of infrastructure. And so that forms a huge resistance. And therefore, the, the push for non-conventional energy has not come faster than what it should have. And that is where the government has to take an initiative of uh, promoting that kind of translational research. And, uh, you know, many areas have identified that this is important, that there is a lot of money to be made in clean energy. But still, the progress in this innovation has been very slow, as I said, because of several reasons, the risk factor, and whereas the, the kind of investments that are required are very large, okay? So that is why much of that uh, alternate or clean energy is stuck between in the value of death because they will find very difficult to for venture capitalists to come and finance this because the risk is very high. They know that the resistance to change is very high because large in scale infrastructure needs to be changed, okay? So these, are, but these are all advanced batteries, advanced biofuels. Uh, you know, these are all technologies which which can be very useful to society. So the U.S. government, for example, recognized that, and they came up with a policy response, and they set up a space under the Department of Energy. They set up what is known as the Advanced Energy Projects, where the funding for this kind of high-risk projects in non-conventional energy could be obtained. So these are funding high risk, cutting edge uh, research. Uh, and the idea is that they will uh, sub, uh, support it with the idea that the researcher should then go ahead and with his prototype, uh, the research organization should then be able to find investment from the private. So, uh, and that was successful. You can see that for every $40 million, uh, when they invested $40 million in 2009, 2010, it attracted about 200 million from the private funding, okay? And uh, the, the, the person who was a director at that time was an Indian, Arun Majundar, and he, his role in to, was to identify opportunities, create competition. 
Okay, so what he did was in many of these areas that I mentioned in the previous slide, he gave multiple projects to different uh, scientific groups. And so that they were made to compete with each other uh, with the idea that if they do well, they will get more funding from the industry. And this potential candidate, finally, they funded about 108 potential breakthroughs uh, projects uh, with about two to 10 million. And then many of the few, only few of them became successful, but the successful ones then attracted a lot of money from the industry. So the second policy was they called what they called a cluster innovation consortium. So this is what we call an interdisciplinary team. You can see early stage researchers, they lack the technological uh, promise. They, they show good technological promise, but they don't understand the market outcomes. They don't understand how to build, bring funding uh, strategies. Okay. So cluster mentors included venture capitalists, end users, manufacturers. So this kind of interdisciplinary team was built to both support uh, the researcher in the early stage. And so the role of the cluster was to support promising ventures, facilitate handovering of laboratory research, reduce information asymmetry. What do we mean by information asymmetry? As I said, the researcher knows everything about the technology, but he knows nothing about the market. So bankers, others who are present here can advise these people on how they can go about it. So in this process, the first value of bridge, uh, value of death was bridged. So the consortia and the RPIE funding was able to bridge the first value, which is called the uh, technological value of death. But then you have another value, which is the industry value of death, uh, is one that has to cross over to society. So how do they address that? That is what is called as a commercial value of death. So how do they address that? The Again, the governments came in, they helped to develop pilot uh, demonstration plans and uh, venture capitalists were uh, sub, uh, also came into this picture at that time. And what they had set up was a kind of a bank uh, which would support this kind of clean energy. And the policy response was to start something called a Clean Energy Deployment Agency, CIDA. Okay, what they did here was they provided soft loans. And those, those soft loans with low interest loans were able to, you know, and that was managed by project managers, very much like a bank. And they seeded uh, through government funding they seeded many of these uh, technologies. And when they become successful, uh, 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 then the industry takes over. The second policy was they created what is known as uh, uh, test facilities. So every an industry like energy industry has to require a lot of testing facilities are required. And each industry will find it difficult to set up these kind of facilities. So the uh, there was a national center uh, for uh, National Center to for uh, test beds, and they uh, their role was to identify national network of uh, where you can have demonstration zones, pilot plants, and other things, and that support this. And in the process, you had the second value of that. And so now you can see many non-conventional energy like batteries and uh, automobiles actually making it into society. So this is one example of the approach of how. The government can promote interdisciplinary interactions between members of society to bring about that. Okay, I will give another example. In United Kingdom, they have centers what they call as a catapult, and the role of the catapult is to exactly to do the same thing: to take ideas from the laboratory into the society. And uh, again, here you can see their idea is for each pound that the uh, British government uh, invests, they are projecting a growth of about seven pounds from the industry. So that is the kind of growth there. Okay. So what do they do? They have identified different sectors, uh, high value manufacturing, cell therapy, and so on. And they're located in different parts of the country. And here, what they do is exactly like what we said about the earlier two policies that the US has done in terms of banking, in terms of uh, uh, information support on uh, to scientists on how they can find industry partners, uh, test bed facilities, all of these in specific areas were created. So you can see this is how England had addressed these issues. Okay, And you can see in Germany, you have, uh, apart from the universities, you have two kinds of institutions. One is called the Max Planck Institute. And you can see that in the Max Planck Institute, about 80% of the basic funding comes from the government and only 20% comes from the industry. On the other hand, they also have the Fraunhofer Institutes, where 70% of the funding is coming through the yeah, industry and only 20 to 10 to 30 percent comes from the uh, government. 
So you can see that there are two institutions which are helping to bridge these values uh, of death. And that is why, again, in Germany, technology development takes place in an innovation level is very high there. In India, we have the CSR systems. The National Institute for Interdisciplinary System was one of those. But you can see that, uh, uh, you know, the definition was not very clear because they needed to both uh, do the job of what the Max Planck Institutes were doing as well as the uh, Fraunhofer. And so that made it difficult for them to bring about the kind of innovation that was necessary. Today, of course, many of them, these labs are now recognizing this. They're restructuring it. They're starting incubation centers which are public and private partnered. There are many initiatives within the CSIR which is trying to promote interdisciplinary research and which is what is required. Okay, so uh, so with that, uh, I have uh, now, you know, more or less uh, covered the two topics that I wanted to talk about. One was what is interdisciplinary research, why it is important, and the other is the role of interdisciplinary research in bringing about innovation. And by innovation, what we mean is taking ideas from the laboratory into society. Okay, so with that, I conclude these two talks. Uh, I'll just spend a few more minutes you know, talking about uh, how we approach it uh, when uh, in the National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology uh, of how to bring about this kind of interdisciplinary interaction, because this will also give you some idea about how that can be done within an Indian system. So, uh, okay, the, 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 as I said, the earlier, earlier name of the institute was the Regional Research Laboratory. And uh, this was renamed in 2004 as the National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology. So prior to that, we had about 13 divisions, very small divisions. Uh, and uh, these divisions then were merged and into five divisions, which was the Agro-Processing Division, the Biotechnology Division, the Chemical Science and Technology Divisions, the Materials and Minerals Division, and the Process Engineering Division. So this, uh, there was a certain level of consolidation that took place in 2004. And uh, so many areas were brought together and they were asked to work on these, okay? So this is, uh, I, I took over as the director in 2009. And uh, so we, I, we, this is the kind of changes that we brought about at that time. That what we felt was that it, even though these five departments do exist, we have to find some common problems. Uh, of uh, how to uh, which which could benefit society and where the expertise from different uh, sectors could be brought in so we identified basically two areas one was advanced functional materials where you needed the expertise of chemists uh, materials and minerals department as well as the uh, engineering department on the other hand we also felt that there was a very strong uh, need for society for bioorganic systems uh, where agro-processing department was there and chemical sciences and biotechnology together, they could develop certain things which would be of value in, in the chemistry biology interface. So basically what we did was we identified these two interfaces, the chemistry materials interface and the chemistry or chemistry engineering interface and the chemistry biology interface. And we tried to focus on this, uh, you know, in, in these two systems. So. Uh, you know, there is uh, just a, a, a demonstration. And apart from that, we also have said that uh, there should be a certain amount of uh, contribution from all these departments in what we call a societal intervention, what we would call the application-based research or the Edison quadrant that I talked about. So high, not high-level science. Uh, here in these areas, you need very high-level science to be interacting with the application and industry. Whereas here, you don't need high level of science, but at the same time, you can find solutions which are of useful to the society uh, and uh, help the improve the quality of life of uh, uh, people at the bottom of the economic pyramid. So these were, uh, the, in that process, these were some of the areas that we identified, uh, are, you know, targeting biomolecules, biomass utilization in uh, agro-processing. We were talking about crop protection and uh, enzyme processing of spices. In energy, we talked about uh, um, photovoltaics, uh, molecular diagnostics, uh, strategic uh, materials for rare earth-based pigments and magnets, so on. And uh, in the societal intervention, we talked about how we could extract uh, natural fiber from um, uh, pineapple leaves or banana fiber or you know coconut fiber in a, in a more ecologically better manner uh, innovation cluster talked about the interaction of spices and ayurveda and nutrition also so this how 
uh, we classified ourselves and and uh, many of these i won't go into the details but you can see that this kind of interaction then attracted some industry interaction in each of these areas so i don't want to go into the details of this uh, in natural products our uh, organic chemists got interacting with many of the com uh, ayurvedic communities the tribal communities to find out which are the medicinal plants which are of importance and then look for isolation of some of those products modification of some of those products which led to some very interesting innovations in this area in nanomaterials was another area and so on biotechnology so each of these areas so in my own group we had also a project which was a multidisciplinary interdisciplinary interaction which was an indo-european project uh, between several institutions and several groups Okay, so these were the European partners. Uh, Dr. Muthing, uh, Mukundan Telekat from Germany was leading this. You can see Rene Janssen, who was from Netherlands, again, a very leading scientist. All of them uh, formed the European group. And from India, we had uh, our National Institute of Disciplinary Interdisciplinary Science. We had three of us from here. And we have the Center for, for um, uh, Ultra Frost Processes from Chennai, we have Indian Institute of Science. Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research. And each of us had very clear tasks identified. And we worked together. And this was the kind of networking system. Many of our students went to Europe. Many students from Europe came to our lab. Okay, And uh, so this kind of uh, different work packages were identified. And you can see that the idea was to develop these kind of flexible solar cells. And uh, initially, because of uh, ours was more in terms of basic research, but the Europeans were able to contribute much more to the technology. But in the process, we were also able to learn many of the technological processes. Okay, so today, this is the facility that we have at NIST. And we, this is the kind of solar cells that we are able to produce in the laboratory. And so that is how the Institute gained through these kind of interactions. As I said, when A and B joined together, you developed a new kind of systems and technologies even uh, and capacities and that is what happened uh, at kcst uh, we started something what is known as a partnering academic and industrial research this the idea here was that we invited industries to provide sponsorships for phds uh, so that uh, and so that the phd could be selected jointly by the industry and the institute uh, where they worked where they potentially worked and kcst would then provide them the uh, uh, consumable uh, project. So, so this uh, this was reasonably successful. You can see that the the companies then get for a very small amount of money. They are able to get people to work on problems of their own interest. And we had one such very successful interaction between Winwish Technologies, CSR NIST, and the University of Kerala, and uh, that won the National Technology Award because it was to basically to. Um, uh, develop uh, a, a handheld Raman spectrometer. Uh, this is a, a interdisciplinary interaction uh, with ICER, uh, Trivandrum had with the Agricultural University in developing Raman based uh, sensors for pesticide detection in plants. Okay, so, so these are just a few examples. I will stop here uh, uh, just to tell you how interdisciplinary interactions can be promoted, how the kind of structural changes that need to be done. And um, you know, one of the things that we did at NIST was make many young students, uh, the convener, uh, young scientists, the conveners of many of these programs. And they have much more energy. They bring in different groups together and they have uh, no, West, they don't have a, a fear, a loss of some uh, prestige or, uh, you know, the, the, their risk taking abilities tend to be much higher. And so they also brought about uh, that kind of restructuring also brought about a lot of change in the inter interdisciplinary interactions in the institute. So with this, I will now stop.